So I come um, from a place in Kenya called West Pokot. It's a county, Kenya has around 48 counties. Um, before, they, they used to be provinces. Um, we had around eight provinces. And um, over a long period of Kenya trying to deal with the problem of corruption and dictatorship, um, and kind of um, the country, the people talking back and forth about what that would be like, trying to, you know, we were ruled by Moi, and he was such a dictator, and he's the one who brought on the concept of provinces. And a lot of people felt that money was going to a central pot and it was used by a few. And so for a long time, Kenya had like um, community mobilizing and education about democracy and uh, decentralization of governance. And it didn't take root until um, 2007 uh, when we had like the constitution was revised and um, they adapted a system of. Um, um, county governance where it was divided by sections of where the tribes, key tribes are. And so now we have 48 uh, counties instead of eight provinces. So one of those counties is called West Pokot, and the dominant community in that area are called the Pokot. Um, um, I have a map. <laughs> one of the pictures is a map. If you, it's just going to look, um, at the beginning you will see a map of Kenya where there's a section that has a, a green um, highlight. Um, that green highlight is, um, is where West Pokot is at. And um, so I was brought up there. I was born and brought up there, educated there, but I'm not of uh, the Pokot ethnic tribe. I am of a tribe called the Sabaot. But Sabaots and Pokots are kind of neighbors. And so my mom um, has had a long, um, like she had a bad experience in her home that kind of led her to leave home and live with the nuns, and then the nuns took her out of the community. So by the time she was done with education, she decided not to go back to her home. She came to West Pokot to kind of try to find a home, of, um, to make a home for herself and find a life for herself. And so business is what took her there, and uh, it, uh, West Pokot people kind of welcomed her, and she, she has become a Pokot herself, like in the way she approaches life and things about life is actually very much of a Pokot um, ideology, like her ideas are much more like the Pokot rather than the Sabaot, and so she brought us up in that context, and I did not know any other community apart from the Pokot community, so having grown up there and having had most of my friends and people impacted my life being Pokot, I sort of, um, feel that they are more of a community to me than the suburbs who are in a different county. And so um, my story is so much connected with that land, the West Pokot land, and very much connected also to my, mom, my mom's story and her history. And even the founding of Jitokeze is so much connected to the land of West Pokot. Um, so we started Jitokeze or Roma Africa, which is a community-based organization that we, we call Jitokeze because it's Jitokeze is a Swahili word that means unveil yourselves or emerge, right? And Romama Africa means women of Africa. So we named that because I felt like um, part of my job was um, to kind of work with the community to help the community realize the potential that they have is great and they can harness that potential to bring about sustainable development, yeah because the county is very much affected by poverty, and we are affected a lot by climate change, uh, specifically droughts is one of the biggest problems that we have that causes us, has caused us over time to depend on food aid and uh, to also, like uh, we've had our neighboring communities, the Sabaot and the Trukana are the ones that neighbor us, go into conflict with us, the Pokots, right, because of, um, trying to access the same river source or pastures and so one community feels that you're, you're not supposed to be here, this is our land and then the other community feels like no, it's open, communal land so we can share, you know, and, and we have also had a problem where boundaries are not quite clear because of um, the way it was done during the colonial days. So the issue of that, like the historical setting of boundaries and droughts causes a lot of conflict to happen. And so I felt growing up, I, I, that was my reality. Conflict was my reality. My reality was also hunger and depend on, depending on food aid. 
I also have a reality of um, having to deal with poverty and struggling to get education and seeing my mom struggle so hard but still like she ha she struggled very hard but she never gave up. She, she, did, she never felt pity for herself and she never felt like it was hopeless, the situation of the poverty she was going through because of, she just was a fighter always and she taught us to fight and she worked, she did all she could to make sure we got an education and so I felt in many ways that um, the fact that she had that spirit empowered me a lot since I was a child and it empowered me to know that I'm not really a victim. Like um, we, we may have a lot of problems going on around me and my community but we are not victims. We have power within us to actually get ourselves out and another thing that my mom liked to tell us when we were growing up is that education is the key and we are not going to have a savior. Our savior, mm -hmm. we are our own saviors and we needed to be educated not just like going through school like formal education but also informal education about like how the community works and uh, you know just informally knowing what's going on and you know trying to access um, whatever resource you may need to deal with the challenge you're facing and so she educated us so much about that and she also um, educated us especially me as a firstborn about the responsibility that I have towards my siblings and the, the role that I play um, as a, an agent of transformation for my family and my sisters and cousins that I have who um, have not had the kind of influence that she was having on us, right? Um, because a lot of our extended family also have struggled a lot with poverty and my mom's sisters and brothers were not as motivated to make sure that her, their kids got education. And so my mom always told me as a firstborn that if I don't perform well in school, if I don't take serious my own empowerment, I'm going to set a bad example and I'm going to compromise the welfare of my children, my grandkids, and the welfare of my sisters like and their grandkids and their children and their grandkids and also my cousins. So it was a big burden. <laughs> But I sort of, I, fa I felt like she helped me to, to realize that my life is not my own and what was invested in me wasn't just for me. It was, it was not enough to get and just sit on it and enjoy. It was actually for sharing <coughs> with my sisters, my cousins, extended family, the community itself and the generations that was going to come after us. And so that um, kind of taught me since I was young to have a desire of having a positive impact and kind of using what I have to bring back change um, of transformation in the community. And so over time, I just found my way, like I, I came to realize that as I envisioned the, you know, my life and um, you know, the kind of dreams that I have for myself, there's no way I can separate that from the realities of my community and the needs of the community. And so having uh, having myself gone through the challenges that my people are going through, I realized that the privilege I got with my mom was so great and that's the gift I could bring back. And so I just prayed a lot when I was young that God would use that, you know. And so when I was in high school, I got, that's um, like, I'd say around grade 11, that's when I came to know Christ. And I came to know about his kingdom, right? And I, I, at that time I remember, it was a, like a weekend program my school used to have. I don't know if here in the US they have such programs. We call, weekend, we call them weekend challenges, where they organize for speakers to come and they share the gospel. And it's very entertaining. I used to enjoy it so much for the entertainment. <laughs> but this, like, um, you know, from form one up to form two, it was just fun for me, like attending it for entertainment. But when I got to form three, which is like grade 11, this one sun, sun, um, Sunday afternoon, I was sitting with my two friends and the preachers, they were from Tanzania, they came and shared. And for the first time, I just felt the heaviness of um, my scene and um, the brokenness that is, um, you know, I was born into um, being a human being and how that affected Christ, you know, and the kind of sacrifice he did, he paid 
on my behalf just to have me restored. And in that time, the preacher also focused so much on helping us to understand that the brokenness of the world, um, it, it is like we have a role to play in bringing about wholeness. And so I, I, now it made sense to me, um, this thing called salvation wasn't only just for me. You know, it was, I was supposed to actually be an agent also for Christ, right? And so that day I made a dedication of faith and asked Christ to just walk with me and guide me and help me to know how to live as a child of God and bring about transformation in the world. And so it took me like a long time to come to know what re that really meant. But in many ways, my journey of faith um, and my history in my family became, um, you know, it, it is what guided me to the work that I do right now. And um, very much the philosophy that I grew up in is what actually drives me now uh, to work with Jito Keze. Um, so I just, um, going on along, like um, after getting to know Christ, um, I came to realize that um, you can have like passion, good desire, and you know, have big dreams, but you actually need skills to make those a reality, right? I'm sure every one of us knows here, since you're here, you know, to get the skills you need to pursue the dreams that God has put in your hands. So um, that for me uh, meant after high school, kind of doing a lot of volunteer work. I started, I, I just felt um, that I needed to be empowered by people who are like older, doing community development work and stuff. So um, normally in Kenya after high school, uh, people, like if you're looking to go to university, you have about two years. If you're gonna go into like a public program, um, you, perform, you perform well and the government would give you like a subsidy for tuition. If you got that chance, you would have to wait two years. But if you did not uh, perform well, and your family is able, then they can take you to university maybe six months after you graduate from high school. But in West Pokot, that's not a reality for many people. In fact, even just accessing the education with the government is not a reality, because I found um, many people would not even finish primary school because of not affording school fees, and girls sometimes would get into secondary school and they would drop off because of the challenge of poverty, you know, and the challenge of also having parents who don't really understand the importance of education and so they were not motivating them as much as um, parents should in order to have, you know, uh, their children succeed, you know. So we had, I knew friends who would drop off at primary school and secondary school and so um, for me, I felt that it was a privilege that I was motivated so much by my mom to work so hard. And, so I did well, very well at high school, and I was able to be among the few. Actually, that the year when I graduated high school, only four girls qualified to get um, subsidy from the government for tuition. And there, um, about 200 and, um, I think 260 girls graduated from high school that year, but they did not, like uh, performance was very low. That was like, do you know the reality of education for me? I don't know if any of you has been to Africa. Has any of you been to Africa or from Africa? You from from which country? Uganda. Oh, you got, oh, That's my neighbor. Yeah. Um, so, are you from Africa? Yeah. Oh, Nigeria. Nigeria. Okay. So I grew up in like uh, when I was growing up, we were very poor and we did not have electricity for a long time. So we used to study with lantern lamps. That's what I would use to study for my homework. And um, coming back home also, we had a lot of work to do before you would concentrate on homework. Here in the US, it's different. I used to live with um, an American family. And kids, the priority for the kids, education is first. Education and extracurricular. And they have parents who, like in the family where I was staying with, they have housekeepers come in and help with housework and so that the kids can have time to do homework when they come home from school. That wasn't my reality. I would come home from school, you have to work first, then you participate in cooking, and then you study after you eat supper, right? And it's already dark, and so you have to use like a lantern lamp. And so it was hard conditions, you know? And so for me, even going to secondary school and being in a boarding setting where they had a generator that brought electricity, 
was like really a red thing, you know? <laughs> and so I think that was probably one of the reasons why a uh, few girls did well in school. Um, and it's only like four, my year it was like four girls out of 260 that actually performed well enough to access university, you know? And so, um, so the odds were really against us, I think, as girls. And so, um, anyway, so I was called um, <laughs> into the university, and so I had these two years that I could do a lot with, and so I decided to do volunteer work with water. I went in and worked with an organization that was working with the community to educate them about clean water and hygiene. And so I learned quite a bit from there. I learned a lot about uh, community organizing and about the needs of women, especially in the area of nutrition and health, you know, and food, food security. And, and then after that, I also went and, and volunteered with another program that was doing planting of trees. And there I learned quite a bit about the importance of trees and promoting forestry as a, as, um, a way of doing community development. And um, anyway, so, it was good for me, that kind of exposure. And when I went to university, a lot of things also were kind of making sense to me because I, I chose a course that was also very practical. You know, in Kenya, um, like, you have different kinds like BA, BSc, and I don't know about undergraduate programs in the US, but in Kenya, where there's some courses that you can take that are very theoretical. Like Bachelor of Arts is very theo theoretical. But uh, if you do like a course in Bachelor of Arts in Environmental Studies, it gets much more specific. And that's what I did. I did Environmental Studies and Community Development. So got a lot of practical ex um, exposure to the practical side of things. And so after graduating from that, I got a chance to also utilize it. And, and so um, for me, um, taking my education also was a way of kind of um, um, nurturing myself towards coming back to the community to do something about the poverty and the hunger that was going on there. And so that, that is like the background that I just want to share with you, to share with you, like to help you understand the person behind and uh, you know the kind of influence that I had that, that led me to start this organization. Yeah. And so I came to Eastern having that big dream and a big burden of like, okay, now I have an idea what community development is about. I have an idea about environmental things, and I know I want to do something about food and the needs, address the needs that women have in my community. So I just had that big heart, but I didn't know what it was going to be when we start implementing it. And so I decided to take courses at Eastern Lake Sustainable Development was a very practical course for me that I took with Stan. It was, I, I did a lot of the homeworks that Stan, <laughs> Stan gave me, and there was another course on leadership. Um, there was a course also on uh, research, um, and a course on program planning. Those courses, all of my assignments, were, I was just visualizing going back to West Pocot, and so I wrote my assignments based on uh, what I had known was the reality on the ground, and I, was, I also was writing it based on the fact that for me, it wasn't just a paper or a grade I was gonna, a paper to submit or a grade I was gonna get, but something that would be like in my, um, you know, the folder that would guide me when I go back to Kenya, you know. And so, um, so I'm so glad that Eastern had also the cohort set up for, for the way that they implemented this program because I got close to a few people like Naomi. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> I met some good friends, Naomi, Christine, another girl called Kila, and we used to, so we used to get together to do our assignments together, and more than that, we would sit together and kind of know, like, what is God doing in your heart, you know? How are you doing as far as um, processing and reflecting on these philosophies and the re that you're learning, or, you know, a lot of the students also that have come into the program are also going through a place of, um, um, trying to figure out what they were going to do when, when they finish. And so they had like experiences from all around the world, experiencing um, like where they've gone for missions and stuff. And they just had an idea about something they might want to do, but they were not sure what it was. And so the cohort setting provided us a place to reflect on those experiences, to reflect on the kind of learnings we were 
are going through and the kind of unlearnings also that we were going through about doing community development and dealing with the problem of poverty in the world and so we were like sounding boards to each other you know and I just so much appreciated that I feel like um, I would say it, it played a very big role in actually empowering me towards taking the step in starting the organization and being here with you guys I think I would just like to encourage you to harness that to harness the power that is in the relationships and the friendships that you're making here and um, for, for me like uh, looking back to um, the power um, <laughs> come down for a bit. <laughs> um, when you, when you, um, so when we go to plan for the startup of the organization, uh, you do project planning and you, you realize <laughs> money is like, <laughs> excuse me. Um, you realize that at the end of the day, um, doing work takes money, you know, and <laughs> sometimes you wonder where you're going get, to get it, especially, um, if you don't have, like, um, you know, <laughs> um, rich people around you who would be able to support you in that work. Sometimes, um, you, I, like personally, I got very, I would wonder to myself, like, this vision is so big, now we did a budget and it needed a lot of money, but it's like I might have to give up on it if I don't get the money that's needed for that. And I took courage in the fact that also at Eastern we had learned about uh, fundraising um, through grant writing, right? And then I, anyway, um, I realize still, even to access grants, sometimes you actually need relationships and people who know people and coming from Africa with not so much of um, access to the, that kind of power people. Um, it just, some, uh, there were times when I went through um, um, a phase where I would feel like, oh, it's impossible. <laughs> like, probably I will never get the money. I may, I may just go to Kenya and, um, <laughs> find that the reality is, you know, like um, there's no money and the reality is I cannot implement um, what I had envisioned, you know, and, and so um, for me, um, I think that was one of the things that God had to work out in my life, like um, to work out, uh, uh, to kind of deal with the philosophy that I had carried for a long time about who is the source, who is the provider. I realized that I had to come to face the fact that God was actually my provider and he was calling me to this one and he would provide for it. And so I prayed so much about that and one of the prayers I used to make when I was still here was uh, that God would prove uh, that this is actually his will by also making provision for it and provision for social support and moral support but also financial provision. And so. I'm, I'm so glad also because so I think God answered my prayer to, to by bringing people who he was working out, um, like the friends I had, um, God was tr also trying to challenge them about uh, what to do with the privilege that they had as Americans. And so we found, we found each other. Like my friends, like Christine, um, Christine uh, Bidgen, she became very close to me. We went to um, Kenya together, and one of the journeys she was going through was the fact that um, the reality of the fact that she was brought up in so much privilege, and um, she felt called to kind of redistribute, work towards encouraging her church and her people to understand the role of redistribution of wealth in um, establishing the kingdom of God. And so, it was. I feel like God brought her in my life also because we ended up being partners like we envisioned it together and actually <laughs> together sometimes we despaired about the big budget <laughs> we would think to ourselves well we gonna get all this money like <laughs> 
sometimes like sometimes I found myself being the you know like the firstborn sister. Like if any of you is a firstborn here, one of the things you learn is that you sometimes have to be the strong one and the one who who is encouraging um, the others, and you you sometimes must not show weakness, <laughs> right? And so. Uh, even when I was doubting sometimes, I would just encourage Christine and tell her, you know, Christine, we just have to walk by faith and trust God will provide. But then other times I would be like, <laughs> really, what am I talking about? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so like, I don't know, it was just... <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, um, so, um, like, I, would, I think... I, I, I like to think about um, the image in the Bible where God talks about the yeast working itself out in the door. Uh, I think that scripture probably talks about the growth of the kingdom of God and how it grows and you have no idea like how it's growing. But for me, it also personally talks about sometimes go, the way God makes our faith grow. Person, like in our personal relationship with him. Sometimes you have no idea that the conflicts you're going through and the hardship is actually the opportunities God is giving you to develop greater and greater faith. And so, um, anyway, through the relationships I had at Eastern, uh, we sort of also got connected with churches, and churches became the uh, foundation of the support that I got when I went back to Kenya. And I didn't go back like having a lot of money, but um, through uh, the church that Christine uh, goes to, we got a small grant for the first year in 2012. And so when we went, I started implementing the work and um, a lot of my focus stayed with uh, the agricultural bit, where I was educating the farmers a lot about the reality of climate change. And you know, they know about it, but the science behind it, they don't understand. And sometimes it's hard for people in, in my community to make the connection between the the role they play in environmental degradation, like deforestation, with the kind of drought that they are going through, you know, and um, the fact that continuing to misuse the environment actually makes poverty worse for, for them. And so when I went back in 2012, I did a lot of sensitization for the community, you know, and uh, I met with many people to educate them about the fact that we, we have the power to actually ourselves develop our own resilience towards these droughts that are becoming many, as in much more frequent than they used to be, you know. And so while doing that sensitization, um, I would encourage farmers to kind of organize and be able to work together to uh, deal with the problem. And so um, I, I met, I think from, from um, when, when I would go to do sensitizations, I used to collect um, information about attendance and I'd say in 2012, I was able to sensitize more than 15, like 1,500 farmers, mm -hmm. actually. And um, I educated them, but in 2012, in 2013 is when we started to kind of bring them to learn now about the self-help group concept. I don't know if anyone is familiar here with it, mm -hmm. where you teach um, people to be in groups and be leaders for themselves. You also teach them to harness the... Um, you know, to save money together and also to mobilize for like seeds, for example, or you know, um, land, if they need land, whatever resources they may need in the group for a common project that they have, you teach them how to do um, mobilization for that. And so self-help group concept for me, it was one of the things we wanted to do in the first year. We, they did, we wanted to um, educate people about that and organize them. We also wanted to educate people about climate change and um, the role that um, sustainable farming, specifically agroforestry, where you grow trees together with crops or you grow trees for the benefit of livestock. In other situations, you can do agroforestry where we are, you're raising livestock together with crops and um, trying to have them depend on each other without you needing to access chemicals that would help you with the increasing production, you know. And so we also, we had the plan for that, and I also, one of the key uh, livestock I wanted to promote was chickens, because for me it was easier to, to kind of um, directly touch the life of a woman with chickens rather than like a heifer, right? <laughs> uh, because in West Pocot, um, like cows and big animals are the property of the man. 
but chickens are property for the women and it's so easy to actually have pro like a, a woman going to sell eggs and owning that money than if you give, give her like a goat, it would be a man's goat and he would go and sell it and make the decision over that money. And so um, for the agroforestry bit that involves livestock, uh, for me, it was I was promoting chickens for, for women to start micro um, enterprise programs where they were increasing the production and not just raising chicken for food or you know eggs only, but they would think about it from a business perspective. Um, and so the other thing I wanted to do was to work with the farmers to find ways of dealing with the problem of water. And so um, when when I went back to Kenya um, in 2010 with Christine. We did a research, and part of what I found out was about a um, type of water harvesting structure called subsurface dams uh, or a sand dam, which you can construct on a seasonal river, and it would harvest water and sand. Sand also harvests water, and you can use that water for irrigation. And so, Christine and I, having seen the reality of that, we decided that it needs to be part of our program. And so, in 2012, when I went. The big plan involved all that, so we needed a lot of money, and <laughs> we were not, um, I don't know, we just did not know, like, um, we needed to kind of do small things first, you know. So anyway, so when I, we had the big plan, but I ended up actually just doing a small portion of it. And then in 2013, God was gracious because he provided for us um, another, like an increase on a grant that allowed me to have a staff and some volunteers. And so with the staff and volunteers is where, where I was able to actually go far. And, uh, and so in 2012, I, we ended up working with around 820 farmers only, who are organized in around 64 groups. Um, they are now like working together in the groups. And um, this year, 16 of them are going to be, the 16 groups are going to be raising chickens. Uh, but all of them are actually working towards producing uh, sorghum green grams and this year they're also going to be producing um, sunflowers and uh, cowpeas um, in their farms, in their agroforestry farms. Another method of sustainable farming that we're using is called biointensive farming because agroforestry sometimes works best when a farmer has about an acre and more. You can do agroforestry but if you, she has like a quarter of an acre which is actually a reality for some of my women they only have like an, a quarter of an acre to work with or an egg that is just mm -hmm. near their home. And so those ones, you, 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 it's hard to promote a planting of trees or, a, or an ideal farm that um, um, like a cow is providing the manure and things like that. And so what we do for such small farms is we promote, um, we train the woman to kind of raise vegetables mostly, traditional vegetables like um, Spider plants is so we support them to get seeds for spider plants and um, there's a vegetable called terere. Uh, what's it called in English? Hmm. I forget. <laughs> <laughs> I just I know the names in um, Swahili. We have terere. Uh, we have saga, suja, and pumpkins. They grow pumpkins as well for the leaves they eat. And so we encourage them to um, do companion planting with that. And also we also use uh, pepper like chili pepper and tomatoes, sun, sun that depends on the sun, not, um, you know, not greenhouse kind, you know, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, so 2013 I was able to do that, and this year, 2013 we experienced a lot, a lot of challenges. With the central concept, one of the things we, we saw with the groups is that they were so happy about saving together, but they have trouble some of the groups have trouble accessing the income that they need. And so some of them would come to us and ask if we could help like with grants and things. But I remember when we, we were starting our program, we actually considered doing grants, micro grants, to support them. But then when I got on the ground, I realized I would, it would be so hard for me to manage a micro grant program. Um, and so I would need like another organization that understands um, micro grants and micro loans to help me with that management because um, the kind of trainings I was doing for sustainable farming was very intensive and we just needed to concentrate so much on that. Self-help concept also is very intensive. Like you, you need, we meet with farmers every week and we have a calendar for, every, like we have now eight clusters where we work in, those are like villages 
and um, for each of the, like a village that has, okay, so eight areas, each village has about eight to 10 groups. And that village has a volunteer who we call a um, community facilitator. And so uh, this year we are gonna band the, the villages into clusters so that we can have three main clusters and kind of have a staff that is specifically attached to that. Last year, the staff were serving all around. So, the, um, so in each of the village, for the four groups, one group would meet on a Monday this week. Next week, there's another group for Monday. So every two weeks, they alternate. Because um, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with the farmer field school approach of training. When you, when you do farmer field school, it's very like uh, practical. And uh, so we were working with, we were working with farmers who have no literacy, you know, and so a lot of our training has to be demonstrative. It has to also involve a lot of dialogue and um, a lot of experience, sharing of experiences. Another thing that we do is we, we encourage them to visit each other and learn from each other, you know, from stories and stuff and sharing in the group just experiences. It's actually one of the key uh, ways that we use to train. We just have people share what is going on in your farm. And then we, we have like a group farm where that's where they learn the agronomic side of things. And then um, they're expected to take it back to their farms. So every group has their own site. So on Monday when we meet, it's normally for about two to four hours. If it's a day when, when we are only focusing on the serpent concept, it's only for two hours because um, um, it doesn't take so long to, to kind of train them on that and train them on leadership and stuff. And you cannot do so much of theory also. It's not, you, you find that they, the farmers just, they want to learn one thing at a time, you know. And so, so at, at other times when we have done um, agro, agricultural type of training, we spend up to four hours. And so normally the group meeting starts with like a prayer and then they discuss an issue or if, um, a leader has had problems with people, that's when they, they talk about like a problem that they've had. Normally there's also a lot of conflict that goes on. So there's a session to deal with that. And then there is um, the trainer would share about the targets for the day for the training. And then they would go into the training bit and that's very practical. It can take, so it takes about one hour to do that. Sometimes one hour, 15 minutes and for the training and so, when we were doing an intensive part of circle concept, we felt that we cannot mix it quickly with the agronomic part. And so the concept that we use for the circle training has different phases. The beginning stages is very intense. And then after about eight weeks, it's not very intense because you have to give the groups time to develop and you have to kind of step off it up a little and kind of see them uh, growing into like taking charge you know they, you have to step up and also find give their leaders a chance to develop confidence in leading the groups you know and so you step off after about eight weeks you kind of step off but participate intensely and then after 14 weeks there's another part so there's normally a training on like forming constitutions choosing leaders that's normally the first part then you step off give them a chance to learn each other and kind of develop the skill and then you come back in and now you bring the, um, the training on the financial bit where they now start to save money. So mm -hmm. you, you teach them how to do that, how to run like a, a bank on a table, you know? Mm -hmm. So they have, you teach them how to, like they need to bring group contribution. Um, it's a small percentage. They also bring like uh, their own shares to the group, like their own savings. And then um, if the money is a lot, a lot of my groups actually are not working with like a bank account. They're just, that's the table is their account. And so they would bring all the money. And then um, instead of one person going with the money at home, they borrow from the table. So they would get like a loan of like 100 um, shillings sometimes. Some people would get a loan up to 1,000 shillings. There's groups that save around 40, 40 shillings, which is like 50 cents every week. And the, the highest group that we have is a, a group of uh, young people that also have grown bananas for a while. So they normally sell bananas and they save more. So they save around 200 shillings, which is 
about a dollar fifty every week because they have bananas on their farm. And, but these other women sell eggs and they also sell like herbs from trees. Some of them, when we have a harvest of sorghum, they have a little bit of surplus to sell. They bring in the group. Some of the groups, the women may not have like eggs to sell, so they actually give a service to the group in the group farm. And then the group farm, I mean the groups de decide some, some of the proceeds from that group farm goes to cover the savings of this woman, you know. And so it's, so in, in any one time, sometimes the, the group can have on the table up to 5,000. Kenya shillings. Another time it can go up to like 8,000, you know, and all that money has to be borrowed by the members. And so, so far, they, when they borrow, they also, they bring back next week, and they also bring like um, 10 shillings on top or 20 shillings on top, which is like an interest, but that interest is actually, it doesn't go to their, um, I mean, it doesn't go to the group savings. That interest actually continues to be part of the savings of the woman who brings it, right? And so that's how they keep it going. And so far in my experience, they have used those monies to help themselves with welfare problems. Like um, I remember 2013, they used to ask me a lot if, we, if our organization has been started to help with things like education and uh, people who have um, medical emergencies and stuff, and I would tell them no. And so um, in this 2013, I have found many of them are using the borrows, borrowings from the groups to deal with medical emergencies especially. Actually, that's the biggest. A lot of money, people actually use it to put into medical emergencies. So for us, that was a concern because we, we want to see them invest more in uh, productive activities like farming and the chickens, maybe increasing the flock, or you know, um, com buying commercial feeds, feeds also to help with the improving the production of the chickens. And so um, this year, we are gonna include in the training a part on uh, enterprise, like savings, saving money for enterprise and learning to run, run like, um, like understanding the costs that you have in your food production system and saving part of your money weekly with a target of increasing production for the next year. So, and also last year we gave seeds, this year we see we will not have a problem accessing some of the seeds we give to our farmers. And so we would like eventually to see them actually just buy their own seeds and take control of that instead of us always like sourcing from the government. The government supported us last year quite a bit with seeds. Yeah, so, yeah, so, <laughs> yep. <laughs> Yeah, so that's that's like um, I focus so much on sharing about the agricultural project. Um, part of the um, like part of the program that we run in Kenya is actually this uh, tailoring project where we have some of the women who don't have access to land. They live in the more urban area of West Pokot. It's a, a town where our office is located. It's called Makutano or Kapenguria City. Um, some of these women. They move like from the lowland areas. They come to live in Kapenguria, and uh, they live like um. You have plots in Uganda. Do you have like plots? Plots like residential places where somebody doesn't live in their own compound. It's like a long block, and a family has just one room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you have that. We call it plots. Yeah. So in Kenya, some of them they live like in in just one room, and they rent it, and so. Uh, when we did our feasibility study, we learned that some of them had gone to live in those places because they were had been displaced by the conflict that was over water and things, and their husbands died, and so they relocated to look for jobs, like in Makutano, and so um, so they live in those places, and um, we saw that one of the practical ways to help them is to actually develop like alternative skills for them to generate income, and so say, uh, sewing was. Um, the skill that we chose for the time and so we the way that we run the program is we provide the training and then we also help with marketing of their products some of the products you can see here have been made by them and they've had different stages of quality <laughs> anyway um, some of these were made like at the beginning when they were starting the program and some of the best ones that they have were actually made recently before I came and so I tried to look for markets here in the U.S. 
Uh, in Kenya, I also try to work with schools because we've trained the, the ladies to also make school uniforms. Mm -hmm. And we've supplied, um, I think we've supplied three schools with uniforms. Uh, yeah, so eventually we would like to see them kind of develop their own business as a group. Uh, when we started, we had around 20 sewing women. Um, but now we have 12 that are consistent. They come regularly and they save together. The other eight kind of have issues of attendance and part of the self-help group, um, group is actually rules. They normally have rules. If you, if you don't attend the group meeting and you don't bring your savings, you actually charge a fine. And so sometimes um, these ones that are irregular in their attendance get charged a lot and some of the savings that they put in is from the products that they make, right? So like for instance, one of the bags that they may make, we would pay about um, like 500 shillings, which is about $6.25, right? And um, they save 50% of that um, in the fund that will help them to purchase a sewing machine. And so uh, the other part, they would bring to save to the circle group, and then they can also use the rest for whatever use that they have at home. And so when, when the time for paying commissions come, the ladies who haven't attended much normally have little commission, right? So they're not making much. And because also they're, they're being charged a fine by the group, they end up leaving <laughs> a lot in the group. And so they find that it's a problem for them. Like it's not, they're not making much. And so they asked to be, not to be part of the group. So only 12 people are gonna be forming a group, um, like a, a cooperative that um, uh, eventually we wanna look for like contracts where they can get a school make uniforms, supply the school with uniforms, and then I also look outside the country to see who may buy and support the women like that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a lot of talking. I think I went over 30 minutes. I want to talk just for 30 minutes. Uh, I don't know if anybody has a question. Yeah, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, with the agricultural program, do you have partners that you supply to, or is just the source? Oh, or you, do they have to like take care of their own agriculture and do what they want to do with it? Oh, you know, we 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 work with the, with the agriculture program. The approach that we take is a value chain based approach where we try to work with people who are involved in the value chain of a, a, um, a crop. And uh, now we are promoting sorghum, drought tolerant crops, and when you do the value chain approach, it's kind of hard to do so many at a time. So we, we are, uh, for the sorghum project, um, I found, when I went to Kenya, I found that there was a beer company that would buy surpluses from our farmers for the kind of sorghum that we're promoting. And so I tried to access their market and I've also been able to partner with another like a European organization that um, works with them to to empower like community organizations like me to be able to do more of um, um, organizing and helping the farmers to increase their production. But sadly, um, the price that we've gotten so far offered by the business is not so good. And so, and also last year we had a very bad drought and so uh, we had to prioritize and it's not us as an organization that does the prioritizing it's actually the groups mm -hmm. they decide uh, how much they want to sell when they have a surplus how much they want to sell how much they want to keep right so we've done an education for them to to kind of do an estimate for the year how much of sorghum grain they would need uh, like within a three month period a six month period and a one year period so that they don't sell everything but it turns out that um we did not have enough surpluses to make like a big truck that would make it um, reasonable for us to sell to the company. Mm -hmm. Also, we did not really like the price that they were offering, so we made a decision not to sell to them. And so uh, what, one, one of the things that I did was to find, um, to encourage them from, to buy from each other, and we, they ended up buying from each other at double the price that the other company was offering. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So actually the vision that we have for this program, the, the reason why we do value chain best is because they eventually have to form cooperatives and cooperatives normally works, um, a lot of cooperatives kind of focus on, on a specific type of product, right? 
and so especially in agriculture and so we are envisioning a place where the farmers would form cooperatives for like production of drought tolerant crops, production of mangoes, production of um, avocados and stuff and then they can be business people partnering directly with a manufacturer maybe or you know a buyer of surpluses you know. We have we have a staff since two, 2013. I got a staff. 2012, I worked with volunteers, and it wasn't. That's why I, I didn't do much of agronomic training in 2012 because the volunteers were not reliable, and I depended a lot on the Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of Livestock. They have taken in, Kenya, in like Kenya. the government ministry. Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I called them to help me a lot when I needed. But 2013, I I recruited staff who had a background in biointensive farming, and one has a background in seed production, another one has a background in uh, agroforestry for the agricultural part. Mm -hmm. And then I also got like an accountant and somebody who works with administration. And um, for the tailoring, I have two two trainers who are just, they've done training for a very long time. Oh. Yeah, so they just, they spend time training the, farm, the, the women. And then um, for the for the savings part, I did like the, when the staff came, only one staff, the one who is the has a background in agroforestry, knew about savings, right? And so for the others, we did a training for them in 2013, where we were training them about self-help groups and how to encourage the groups to save. And um, another training that we do is called group dynamics, which is basically about leadership and managing conflict when the groups are find conflict among themselves and so we did a training on that and this year also at the beginning of the year we did like a refresher training um, from last year's experience i find that staff need uh, my, every six months we need to do like a refresher training on like a skill that they are struggling to implement and so Yeah, so they've been trained. They, they, uh, now all of our volunteers have their skill set includes um, biointensive farming, um, basics in agroforestry, and group organizing with a self help concept. And now, now because of the enterprise bit, um, we, we included in the training on the self help, we included a method called Village um, VSLA, Village Savings and Loan Association. They have a package within that deals with them. Um, um, training the groups to do a micro, I, I mean like an enterpri enterprise based savings. Yeah. Your staff, Kenny? Mm -hmm. All of them. How many people live in West Pocot? Yeah. How many people? Because basically you cover like a lot of people. Yeah, so now we have 820 farmers. Yeah, it's yeah so how many people live there? 512,000. Wow. Yeah, it's a big county. What are your visions from here? What are you hoping <laughs> happens? Uh, from here in the US? Like with the, the organization as you move forward? I actually, um, we have like a vision at different stages. Like we have a plan. We would like to see the different programs kind of be self-sustaining locally. And for the agricultural program, for us we see um, we would be successful and sustainable when we get to a place where the groups have formed an association and a cooperative. Like an association would be the groups in one village coming together mm -hmm. to form an association that focuses on whatever that village cares about. And then um, a cooperative for us, which would be like on a federation level, would be when West Pocot farmers of Sogam come and form a cooperative. That and they, so I won't have to do marketing for them and things. Or if I do marketing, then they can be a partner with me, and I would promote products from the cooperative. Um, that's where we see ourselves going. And another very uh, key um, activity that we would like to engage in more actively is actually microfinance. Uh, but I don't see our organization being a microfinance institution. I see us partnering with um, like people who understand management of microfinance, and I would just fundraise 
money that can be managed by these other institutions for my farmers to access and be able to boost their enterprises. Because I even see, like with the kind of savings that they're doing, myself, I farm, like I do chickens, I grow beans, I do my own gardening, and um, the cost that goes into like producing enough for you to actually make it an enterprise is much higher than what the farmers are saving right now. So I see a place where they would need to be empowered to access loans and be able to increase production like that. So that's for the agricultural beat. And um, we also, like, um, in this past year, because of the drought, one of the areas, um, the farmers, we talked with them a lot, and they decided they want to do, like, um, use the communal land that they have to do, like, an irrigation scheme. And they wanted us to help them facilitate resources that would be needed for that. Uh, but we, we experienced a bit of uh, like a threat of conflict with that, and so we decided to just focus on peace building until we know that the foundations are right, then we can bring in irrigation, because it's kind of expensive, and you don't want to invest expensive equipment in a place where there's conflict. And so we visualized for that area also that they would have like much more production of food when they have like an irrigation scheme, and yeah, so that's for the agricultural bit. And then for the water. Um, so last year when we constructed the sand dam, the cost was very high and it took us a long time to fundraise for that. And so at the beginning of this year I met an organization. It's actually FAO. Does any, any one of you know FAO? Food and Agriculture Food. Organization? Yeah. They did like a stakeholders training for people who are working in um, food, food security in West Pocot and I attended that. And uh, the training that they were giving was about microstructures for harvesting water on the farm, right? And this was, it was their response to the drought that we had um, in 2013. And so when I attended that, I decided that I wanted the agricultural staff to also be, um, be trained on that. And so uh, February, when we did our training for, for the staff, I got someone who came and trained them on how to do these structures and promote it in the community. So we are partnering now. With the, some, there's someone in the Ministry of Agriculture that was put in place just to train farmers to do that. So we're going to partner with him and he's going to work with our farmers to uh, have them do small structures for water harvesting on their land. So this year we want to do a sand dam. We would like to actually see um, if we can pump the water into a tank and utilize that for irrigation. And then be able to produce like tree seedlings that we need in the project. Um, through that, so so um, when we know, because our organization is so much about food security, we like to see how different things are interrelated as far as the projects we implement is concerned. So we want to figure out if the sand dam actually gives water that is sufficient for high production of food. That is a project then we will continue with and have all other villages be supported with the construction of a sand dam. Yeah. So that's it for that. And then for the sewing project, we, also, we still need like microfinance. Um, for those ladies to actually be successful, they need to run their own business. And we see microfinance is very vital for that. And I would like to see a place where they can be connected to the market in the US to sell products like the ones that they make. And so I've been sourcing for um, partners and trying to see who would be some of the people who would help us to make the sales for that. Yeah, and so I visualize a place where they are connected with the market like that. And um, as an executive director, I have realized that <laughs> I was doing a lot of like implementation and a lot of, in, in so many ways, you can get so caught up in that and forget about moving the organization forward. And so since I got a staff now, I realize I can place myself in a place of kind of empowering them and moving the organization forward. And so I, as an executive director, I see the need to be an organization that is locally sustainable, where we are generating income to run the organization from the local community. And so I see us getting more staff and have them trained, and then also having like an income generating activity that would help me to not look for grants to fund salaries especially. I would like to have salaries be generated locally instead of looking for grants. It's actually a very big challenge. Some of you, I wonder if any of you here would be interested one day to start their own like um, project or <laughs> an organization. 
Mm. <laughs> there, yeah. So since so one of the things you would know is that when you access grants, a lot of the money is limited mm -hmm. to like direct project costs, and I feel like that is a big problem that we have because I feel like that philosophy came from the. Um, mm -hmm the top-down approach where of, uh, that promoted a lot of dependence in Africa. Like people fundraise a lot because they wanted to give things for free. Give tools, give seeds, you know, give, construct housing and they were not thinking about capacity building where you would need to train somebody to actually catch their own fish, you know, and, or raise their own pond, you know. And so um, they, they don't realize the role that staff and volunteers pay play in terms of training people with capacities that they need and so because like I, I know now that's the reality I'm working with I would like to see a place where I don't have to be limited to actually build capacity because a donor won't fund me for that so one of the things I'm trying to see is um, to find if I could find like partners who understand that and could help us to just raise a local uh, business that would be, or even if we get connected internationally, the business can get connected internationally, the focus of that business would be to also raise funding for the, for the staff. Yeah. Yeah. My other question is, in the beginning you mentioned that the area of independence would be able to change with your organization or in Well, I would say, the, the reason um, right now people are not accessing, I feel like at this point where we are, even with the kind of work we have done, if food aid was brought, people would still go and get it. Like, we, I feel like to deal with that problem, um, we need to deal with it from the policy level, the education, we need to educate people again about this issue called dependency. Do you know because sometimes they, some people would go and get food aid and actually um, th there's an area that depended on it so much that when you go and promote food production, they do not want to produce food. Because they knew if they started producing food, then the government would not rank them among a food insecure. Like, uh, you know, we have different rankings for that. They would not be ranked as the most food insecure and so they would not get the food aid. So that is actually one of the challenges that we have in some of the areas in West Pokot. And so I feel like um, it, we have to deal with it from the mind perspective as well, and then of course do more of the food production. And so far, I think the government is tr has changed a policy about provision of food aid. They don't provide food aid anymore. But I, I realize that it's people are not educated out of it yet because when, when the drought hit last year, they, they still came to us and asked us if we could give them relief food, you know? And so we, we like, from the beginning, I, I just told them that that's not what we are about. And so if they want to work with us, we can support them to be farmers, but we cannot food, give relief food. Yeah. How many of the farmers are women compared to men? Um, at, the, at the moment, um, they, they are 60%, and then we have 40% that in, in, is both men and young people, like unmarried, unmarried um, men, and um, there's a school that we work with too, so part of the 40% also includes some of the girls we work with in the school. So right now it's just 60 women. How have you seen um, women's roles changing like in their household expectations or family dynamics, the women who are like their time is being spent doing different farming tactics or working on this one, so I think how is it affecting the other parts of their life? That's really a good question, and I don't want to answer it with authority because I haven't yet done a survey. I feel like I. For me to actually answer it with authority, I need to do a survey and be able to see like how it has, like, reflect on it on the entire project, which I haven't done yet. But one of the things I'd say has been my experience with the groups is I have noticed men who are participating in our groups are becoming more supportive of the women, and they they are not leaving the women to do, especially on the group farms, it's a requirement for them to share their responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And so they are not uh, uh, 
they are not refusing to do that. So I feel like they're sharing duties on that. Another thing that I have noticed, you know, we normally do like a gender awareness about where we, when we do like a training on self help, for instance, or we are doing a farm, farming training, we try and help um, the farmers to understand um, like empowerment for them also is to favor the woman and to to make sure their girls go to school. And sometimes we, we have experienced a situation where some farmers don't attend a training because they have gone for some ceremony on female genital mutilation and like four, like in one of the instances I had was four people did not attend and um, two of them were actually leaders of the group. And so we had to, remember I told you about the way we have two to four hours training and there's a part of a, after prayer where we discuss domestic issues, we call them domestic. Domes. <laughs> anyway, the do part of the domestic issues is the issue of attendance and who owes the group what because they haven't attended for how long, you know, and who's gonna follow up and things like that. And so when we we uh, we are addressing that issue, um, we get to learn why is someone attending and um, failure of attendance for us, in my experience, has been like uh, for women sometimes it's the, like they experience conflict or someone is sick or they went to to do like they went to visit someone outside the community and in um, some of them have gone for like ceremonies so um, this one of the ceremonies I, I found that was destructive was female genital mutilation and so when I faced that I sort of had to address that at that point and t tell the group about what the law says about it and so um, our staff have been trained to see those issues that cut across, like um, gender, gender and labor dynamics, the issue of education for girls, and the issue of violence is also a gender issue. We, we got trained on how to address that. And then another thing is the issue of um, HIV and AIDS, when you, like stigma, especially stigma, like um, the group sometimes, they, <laughs> like, <laughs> it is so funny, do you know? <laughs> earlier on when we were trying to, to have them select leaders, that was an issue that came up. Some people would not want to have a leader who is actually HIV positive. Mm -hmm. And they have come, come up, like they, they publicly have let people know that they are HIV positive, you know? And so it's like a stigma in the mind, you know? And so we had to address that and, and yeah, so. Yeah. And so I would say that we sort of like are affecting the mind at this level. We are trying to educate the farmers to know that it's to the benefit of the men too, that they favor the rights of women and share roles. And I've also noticed that when we go to public meetings that are not necessarily organized by Jitokeze, and we are invited to that, some of the people who are farmers in our group, the men, they stand up to speak on issues that affect women. So in this, like, um, Community meetings, they, it's normally like elders who speak, and, and all of them are men. So they, there's a, women go and congregate on one side, you know, and then men who are the authorities sit on one side, and always the dialogue is led from that side, and women are not allowed to speak. So I have seen some of the farmers that we have kind of stand and share something about what they learned concerning this problem of FGM or why are our kids not going to school? Some of them have shared about the importance of having working with women in the self-help groups. You know, they kind of educate the community, tell them you need to be part of these groups. Look, now this is what we are doing, and you know, it's it would be like benefit beneficial to everyone if they participated in such groups. So I feel like I would not want to tell you with authority that this percentage. Uh, there's been a reduction like in uh, the load of labor on women by this percentage. I wouldn't do that because I haven't done the survey. But I would tell you that on the mind level and just seeing the, the, them kind of have a dialogue going in the community right now about it is um, like it's, it's a positive uh, reflection of the kind of impact we are having. Yeah. Two questions for you. First of all, thanks for your work. I think you're doing a great job. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. First question, sorry if I'm in late and I don't know how long you've been uh, running the organization, mm -hmm. but uh, what are, are you as a leader, what are some of the challenges you have in partnering with other people or other organizations? Do 
do you have any part, strong partnerships at all with the government? I know you mentioned about the Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of Livestock, but how deep is your partnership with the government? Is it hard or is it not that hard? Mm -hmm. And uh, what about other organizations? And then you mentioned about climate change. Mm -hmm, yeah. um, what's your relationship with the meteorological sector mm -hmm. department mm -hmm. uh, for that? Mm -hmm. So um, that's another area of partnership. The meteorological department is one of our partners, and the way that we partner is they give us information about the next. They actually do uh, the projections for the next month, the next three months, the next six months. So they, when they do that, they we are among the people that they depend on to send the message to the farmers, and we need it because we are we do agronomic training, and we need to kind of tell the farmers what to anticipate. So that's the way that the meteorological department partners with us. And um, like for the uh, for the government, so far the partnership has been with the help of the lead that we have for seeds. We last year when we were doing the project planning, we would we would have needed uh, seeds that would cost around uh, fourteen thousand US dollars. They gave us seeds worth eight thousand US dollars that we distributed to all our farmers. We use some of it in our fields. But now they first out that program, and so we are trying to see what would be other ways that they can support if they're not give, gonna give like in kind donations. Mm -hmm. I have found a challenge where they they partner with me by giving me technical support, but it ends up actually being quite expensive and unreliable. And I, in my opinion, it doesn't seem like it's right because the staff that they give me are actually employed to provide this as a service for free. But they normally require, the, like when they spend a day with me in the field, I would have to give them facilitation fees, for money for that. And then I, they call it lunch. <laughs> and then they, I would also have to take them to the field. And they've helped me sometimes. I've, I don't have a vehicle. I normally hire out. And so that's not normally one of the problems that I have. And when the government ministry of agriculture has their vehicle free, they allow me to use it. During the time of seed distribution, that's the vehicle that I really depended on. And so they partner with me like that. And um, another way is um, like we pro when we promoted the Chicken Valley Chain, there was no other organization that was starting to look at that, like a potential business for their families and the community, like um, on a big scale. And so they recognized our work. It was like people were kind of talking about it a lot, and like as an organization, a community-based organization, we are among now the most active ones. We have like a lot that exists on paper, but our work speaks for itself so far. And so they call us to make decisions, like to participate in decision making for the county. Now they are trying to make, to develop policies and infrastructure for developing a food security sector and addressing the problem of climate change. So I've been invited to several forums for that, and one of the forums I participated on was choosing value chains that the government would invest money for setup of industries. And I really campaigned for the value chains that I promote. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, the government has potential to get so much money, you need to help us get factories or you know um, companies that do value addition especially, and they would be funded to um, to get the factory and then they would buy from our farmers and our farmers would be encouraged to produce more. And so I succeeded in getting our indigenous chicken value chain be adapted. They also adapted the mango value chain. And so we, we have a big job to do on that, to get the farmers to produce enough. So they're gonna they, um, source money to have a factory constructed for mango, mango value addition. And we, um, I'm happy because another organization does honey production and they succeeded in getting that in there. And I'm happy for that because when we promote um, growing of trees, one of the things we tell the farmers is about beekeeping. Mm -hmm. They can have um, beehives on some of the trees that they grow on their farms and they should kind of envision enterprises that grow out of that and so. So on a policy level, I feel like now we are starting to be part of, be involved in um, advocating for policies that would favor food security and climate change on the um, level of West Pokot. We haven't gone to the Kenya level, level. I mean, Kenya as a nation level yet, but 
you, we start small and let you are. And Katie, you really worked hard on your chain in North America relationships yeah. for the yeah. Prince of Judah case, and she yeah. really has, has been stirring up interest in as many ways possible. Lots of us involved yeah. in North America to partner at, in, yeah. a, in a way of Africa actually bringing education and teaching into our communities and into our way. So there's a mutuality yeah. of partnership with Prince of Judah Casey. So you, you've been really strong on that yeah. part. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, exactly. Like on the US side, we have Friends of Judah Kese that has been a very strong partner. They also partner not just with the education bit, but governance. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges I have had is the issue of accountability and having a board of governors, gov I mean board of directors that would, I would be regularly meeting with. And so Friends of Jitokeze has provided me that uh, place. And another vision that I actually have for Jitokeze is to have a board in Kenya that is strong and takes charge. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, so I have challenges bringing up such a board because I feel like Kenya doesn't have a background in, people are not educated about governance and volunteering, you know. They want to be paid to be part of a board, you know, and so it has been one of the biggest problems that I have. And so, like, um, we also have partnered with Covenant World Relief um, through our friend Christine, and my church supports my work a lot, Central Baptist Church, and they have connected us with the American Baptist um, churches, and so um, there's a network of churches here in Philadelphia that are, are now coming on board to support our work, and some of these are actually women, and they're just yesterday, yesterday and the day before yesterday, I was in a meeting where I was able to get some of them engaged and now they're gonna be heading the part of marketing products mm -hmm. here in the US, and so I'm really happy about that. Mm -hmm. And um, just like, now that we're talking about partnership, I think one of the things I would like to share that has been a challenge, uh, which country are you from, by the way? Malawi, okay. <laughs> um, I've had one of the biggest, biggest challenges that I've had was is actually working with an international partner. Um, it's called um, UCON. They, they have been with us like from the beginning, but they have not really been with us. Like, like our partnership was a service provision type of partnership where we, we, got to de we decided to uh, increase the targets of our activities with the farmers because they were also interested in the same kind of work, right? And so they were like, since you're on the ground, you can do it, let us, um, contract you like a service provider. And so my original target was actually to work with 200 farmers who are sorghum producers, right? But when they came into the partnership, they gave me such a big target because it was I was gonna do part of their job and they were gonna pay for my um, the expenses that I incur. But since the beginning, they haven't been faithful because also I think they are experiencing problems with cash flow within the organization. And so that's an, like a, this, a good side to partnership, but also you may also find yourself with partners that are also facing their own challenges and it ends up affecting your work, you know? Yeah. All right, well, join me in thanking Kimmy. <laughs> speaker and that ministry, so would I have a volunteer today that might lead us in prayer for that? And then remind me too, there's a, an event Saturday, right? That, that they yes, can come. we have a, an all day, 9 till 2.30, a personal retreat on sustainability at Central Baptist here in Wayne. And if you're really interested, I, there's, I've got some flyers here. And the whole idea, Petey will tell her stories, and we will look at it in our own lives and try to see where does sustainability come from, and how do we know our ecological niche in the world. So we're, we're just bringing together that conversation of Petey's experience and our own experience and our own place in the world, and, and, and a conversation around that uh, in a retreat format. So uh, we'll, I'll be facilitating that with Petey. So there's information here, I'm happy to tell you, talk to you, and also to get to know you. I live right next door. My husband did this program. We came here in 92. We've been around here, worked a lot internationally. My name's Carol Korch, and I'd love to network with you. We're looking for help. We really yeah. need help, and you haven't said it, Katie, but yeah, one of the things we too. long to get out of here, I've come, just anybody wants to start to think about internships, long-term engagement, 
you know, sort of helping to write funds, getting some of your program work done through Jitter Casey, if that's speaking to your heart. We're looking for individuals who really want to partner um, and spend time in their life. I know, and Naomi's been part of that in different yeah. ways. We really are open to how, what that might look like. So join the conversation. Petey's going to be around for another few more weeks, but um, this is the time to kind of get some of that uh, in place. So if your heart's been stirred, here I am. I'll, yeah. I'll be, give me the details. We need, we need all hands on deck. I'm just the networker. Yeah. So, yeah. I remember when I was a student here, we we like we had an internship that was for after right before graduation, mm -hmm. but before that they also gave us like fellowships and opportunities to volunteer with, within Eastern in SLD. Some people were taken outside uh, Eastern and were volunteering with organizations outside, and so I just wanted to add to that and say that it doesn't have you don't have to wait until before graduation if you want to help somehow and be able to actually gather. I feel like. Um, I don't know if that decision is for the SLD people to make or the students, I don't know, but there is an opportunity for people to be engaged even before it's time for internship. And I think it would be like a good type of partnership to have also with Eastern. Yeah. Some, of, some of the things we need to get done are very practical for the nonprofit world, and you would get the, the right skills, the kind of skills you totally would use, you know. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs>